Picture it, the 1700s, Louisiana. Free African and Creole women dressed elegantly. They are known to wear their hair in elaborate styles, incorporating feathers and jewels into the hairstyles, showcasing the full magic and glory of their gravity-defying strands. Now, as a result of their hairstyles and their features, yes, they entice white, French, and Spanish suitors. And their beauty, their beauty was perceived as a threat to white women. And there, therein lies the problem. It seems as though the white women in Louisiana view black women, Creole women, as a threat. So much so that they complain to newspaper editors. Lisa Zay Winters, author of the 2016 book The Mulatto Concubine, Terror, Intimacy, Freedom, and desire in the black transatlantic, she says uh, in some of the antebellum newspapers, uh, there are letters to the editor complaining about the free women of color as being brazen, and they are always described as beautiful, proud, and haughty. These women of color are seen as a threat, so much so that these white women in Louisiana demand to speak to a manager. They go to the governor, Governor Esteban Rodriguez Miro. Now, he was more than happy to do something about the haughty black and Creole women. You see, he was already in a mood about them. Yeah, he already disliked the action that some of these black and Creole women had taken. You see, he thought that they showed too much luxury in their bearing. He thought that they were uppity. You see, that's the problem overall. When black women, when black people, and specifically black women, do not play the role that has been assigned to them, when we are too proud, when we take pride in how we present ourselves, people feel the need to put us in our place. And that's exactly what the governor set out to do. He didn't need much prodding from these white women who were mad that these French, Spanish, and white men were attracted to these women of color. He didn't need much prodding. So in 1786, he passed the, I believe it's Tion, yeah, Tion Laws. And that law mandated that black and Creole women had to wear a scarf or a handkerchief over their hair as a visible sign of belonging to the slave class, whether they were enslaved or not. So yes, both enslaved and free had to wear a handkerchief or a scarf over their hair. So historian Victoria Gould, she notes that the laws were intended to return free women of color visibly and symbolically to the subordinate and inferior status associated with slavery. The laws served to prevent any mixed race woman from passing as white. Okay. And then she goes on to say that the true purpose of the law was to control women who had become too light-skinned or who dressed too elegantly or, in reality, competed too freely with white women for status and thus threatened the social order. So like I said before, they had become too uppity. Now here's the thing though, 
and I think we've talked about it before. Now, you can give us coal, and we will make a diamond, okay? Now, did they follow the rules? Mm -hmm, yes, they did. Follow the rules, but make it fashion, yeah. They used unique colors, jewels, ribbons, and wrapping styles that accentuated their gorgeousness. And there are those who say that these laws helped pave the way for the colorful and elaborate hats that we wear every Sunday, especially Easter Sunday and Christmas Sunday, to church. Now, I don't know how true that is, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was true. <laughs>